Good evening, and thank you. I'm Judy Gradwell, President and CEO of the San Diego Natural History Museum. We know it's been an afternoon of significant news, and we thank you for spending your evening with us. Tonight's talk is the wonderful journey of the cannabis plant. We're excited to dive deep into the science of this impactful plant with Dr. Todd Michael. As an organization focused on biodiversity in our region, it's important that the museum recognize and pay our respects to the indigenous peoples who are the traditional stewards of the land. Specifically, we recognize the Kumeyaay people whose ancestral homelands the museum currently occupies. We extend our respect and gratitude to the indigenous people who have lived on and cared for this land since time immemorial. As the original caretakers and conservationists, we honor their continued legacy of understanding, caretaking, and upholding the pillars of biodiversity. I want to take a couple of minutes to talk about a few upcoming events before we uh, begin with Dr. Michael's talk. Um, and let's see, first, this Thursday is the final session of our month-long State of Biodiversity Symposium. This panel, the final panel, is a biodiversity roadmap for California, which brings together four different perspectives for a conversation on our state's future. The symposium has been wonderful so far, so I imagine our, our finale is going to be no, not, not going to be disappointing in the least. If you missed the symposium, don't worry. Um, for the next, the following NAT talk, the museum's vice president of Con science and conservation, Dr. Michael Wall, will synthesize uh, what went on in the event, sharing highlights from all four talks, and that will be on Wednesday, May 12th. For details on the panelists and the topics, please visit our website. Next month is also a big one for community science. Using the free iNaturalist app, anyone can help advance our region's research and conservation. Through the end of April, you can join the Border BioBlitz project. And then next month, we encourage you to make as many observations as possible because they will be part of the City Nature Challenge. This year is not a competition between cities, but we still want San Diego to come out, come out strong. And if you have no idea what I'm talking about, join us Friday morning for a quick lesson on how to use iNaturalist and community science. This live lesson is great for kids too, and you can check out our recent blog posts on the topic. Throughout 2021, the NAT and our partner Climate Science Alliance will feature seasonal discussions about how the changing climate will impact our region. Our summer talk presented in English and Spanish will delve into the effect of drought on local trees. In the fall, we'll learn about wildfires and how they might change with our changing climate. And in the winter, we've got to talk about sea level and Southern California's coastal communities. Each of these talks will be paired with a more kid-friendly climate change conversation. To learn about any of these or up other upcoming free events, please visit sdnat.org. And of course, these activities could not take place without your support. The tickets you purchased tonight, your donations, your Facebook shares all help the museum thrive during this time, and we thank you. On to tonight's program. The 2020-2021 season of Nat Talks is made possible by presenting sponsor, the Downing Family Foundation, and media partner, KPBS, the public media station serving San Diego and Imperial Counties. Tonight's speaker is Dr. Todd Michael. Todd is a research professor at the Salk Institute for Biological Studies, where his group focuses, focuses on the sequencing and analysis of plant genomes. His group is part of the Harnessing Plant Initiative at the Salk that aims to develop crop plants that sequester more carbon versus exten via extensive root systems containing recalcitrant carbon polymers to fight climate change. Welcome, Todd. Great, thank you for having me. All right. Well, this is a really special um, day to give a talk on 420. Um, I asked my son if he would actually join and watch the talk, um, but he's up at Santa Cruz and he said he had a better offer. So he's gonna miss out. So I'm gonna talk about the journey of cannabis. Um, today. And the journey for most people starts and ends right here with this uh, wonderful chemical that comes out of the flower of the plant, um, THC. However, the journey 
for the cannabis plant has um, actually gone on for a long, long time before our modern day. And I'm gonna tell you about that history through the lens of the genome. However, more recently, um, this chemical known as CBD has become pretty important in um, both natural medicine, but also in just um, recreational um, therapeutics. Um, and there's some really nice work at UCSD showing um, some of the benefits of CBD. So my talk is really gonna focus on CBD because one of the things that I've been really interested in is exactly how does the plant make CBD versus THC? And I'm just showing you some of the pathways here. So can, um, cannabis makes a lot of different chemicals and we're most familiar with CB, THC, um, but it also makes CBD and others um, like CBC that have um, various impacts on um, human physiology. Um, I'm, I'm not gonna get too much into the weeds into um, uh, how these pathways work, but um, I do wanna point out um, some of the benefits. So recently it's been shown that CB, CBD can actually act directly on um, specific receptors um, that are uh, that we all have in our body. So one thing that really makes THC and CBD different in terms of uh, most drugs or um, therapeutics is that we have a natural system that's already set up um, to receive the information from THC or CBD. So we have the, we, we make our own endocannabinoids. And so we have these receptors in our bodies already. Now, I just list off a couple of the, the, the things that have been shown um, uh, to be impacted by CBD. Uh, but some of the big ones are like pain relief, inflammation reduction, um, appetite stimulation, nausea reduction, anxiety relief. These are some of the ones um, that have actually uh, gained the most um, uh, wide appreciation. And then there's some really great stories about seizure reduction. Um, and if you're interested in that, there's some really nice stories online and then also some scientific papers on that. Now, I gotta unpack this a little bit. Cannabis is sort of a big ball of wax because basically we have marijuana, which we think about in terms of like THC and CBD, but then we have hemp and hemp has actually been as important to the human societies over time as marijuana. So hemp has been used for um, rope and other type of textiles and um, as a very big biomass um, component and has been used for lots of different type of energy related activities as well. Now, the definition that separates these two is they're both cannabis sativa, um, but hemp is generally has low THC and has high CBD, whereas marijuana typically has high THC, but can also have high CBD. Now, I didn't say this earlier, but CBD is non-psychoactive. So it, it generally does not have any type of impact um, that THC would have. Now there's a legal definition also that separates these, which is that TH, that marijuana has a THC usually greater than 10%, but definitely hemp has less than 0.3% THC. So that's a very strict definition and if you're trying to grow hemp for CBD and you make too much THC, that's not a good thing. Um, and then the differences in size in the current markets is quite extraordinary. Um, marijuana is in the billions and hemp is in the millions. However, there's um, really a gaining appreciation for getting uh, back into using hemp for multiple applications. So like I said, my main interest in when I started this project was really to understand why do some plants make high CBD and some plants make high THC? And this is pretty important because there are farmers who are growing hemp now for, high, for the added benefit of CBD in, terms of, in addition to biomass. So I'm going back to this pathway just to highlight that the pathway converges on these two genes. So I'm gonna use some terms today um, to familiarize you with sort of the whole realm of genomics. And I'm gonna tell you like how all these terms fit together, but genes are made into proteins and I'm gonna show you how that works. 
And these genes that are actually proteins or enzymes are the last step that turn this um, chemical into the active um, CBD or THC molecules that we enjoy. So as I said, this is a gene. These are synthase genes. It's a type of gene that's actually an enzyme. This is the structure of the protein of that gene. And the protein is like a machine that does something. And basically what it does is it does a chemical reaction and changes one bond into another. And that is how you get your CBD A, which is CBD acid. And that actually has to be heated to be activated. So how does this all work? So we're gonna take a, a step back to the central dogma, um, which is basically getting us familiar with how the biology of an organism actually works. So I told you about proteins and genes, but there's a process by which proteins and genes are coded for in the genome of an organism. So inside every single cell of an organism, you have a genome and that is the code um, that says, grow or make this chemical or what have you. Um, so here's an analogy. Um, basically you have a computer that holds the code. So everybody understands that computers have code that under, are inside of them and that co code can be copied. That's what happens here in this analogy where RNA is made and RNA is then turned into protein. This is basically the central dogma of biology. DNA to mRNA to protein. Another way of thinking about this is your computer is sort of the cell. You know, organisms are made up of uh, millions to billions of cells. And the, um, the actual computer itself is analogous to the cell. Inside the computer is the software. So the software here is analogous to the genome, which is really just a bunch of letters of A, T, Cs, and Gs. So it's a four letter code that makes up the genome. And it's the specific order that they're in that is actually important. And they're in a specific order, but then there's ways of parsing them out to make sense of them. So this may or may not look familiar to you, but this is computer code. So the computer can read this code and then parse it into actions. In the same way, um, we as humans are able to take a book, look at this, these characters like in the book Moby Dick, and say, okay, this is a word, this is a sentence, this is a paragraph, and we could take that information and parse it into information just like this. Pronoun, verb, noun, conjugate, conjugation, adjective, basically you have all these parts of the sentence that actually gives it meaning. In the same way, we can go through DNA. So this is just a stretch of DNA. A, T, Cs, and Gs are the base code. So in in contrast to computer code, which is just zeros and ones, this is four base code, A, T, C, and G. And they're in a linear array that gives us information. And so we have computer programs that will go through and parse out the important pieces. So what are the important pieces? We have on off switch. So this is what turns a gene on or turns a gene off. Then we have the actual gene itself and genes are made up of exons, and introns. So an exon, you get four here, turn into the actual gene that gets trans, uh, transcribed into RNA. And then that RNA gets translated into protein. DNA to RNA to protein. The only reason that this is important to understand is that there's a code and then the code is turning into something. And that's important to understand the journey of the cannabis plant. The other thing that's important is to understand how big the code is. So what I have here is um, COVID-19, which has taken up a lot of our time over the last year, um, has 30,000 bases. So 30,000 A, T, Cs, and Gs. In contrast, bacteria here, so um, like E. coli, has 5 million base pairs or 5 million A, T, Cs, and Gs. Now, in contrast, cannabis has 700 million base pairs. Humans have 3 billion base pairs. And then our favorite Tory Pine has 20 billion base pairs. So quite big. 
Why are they all different sizes? Well, at least for animals and plants, we have these things called jumping genes. And I'm gonna tell you a lot more about jumping genes. Um, some people refer to them as the junk that makes up the, the genome, but basically pine genomes have a bunch of these jumping genes. Humans have a middle amount and cannabis has a less amount, but still a lot. If we were to think about what that actually means in terms of the size of the DNA that goes into every one of your cells, if we were to write it out into a book, and then stack those books up, it'd be the height of the Empire State Building. So all that information is packed into each one of your cells. Well, in 2001, the, um, the Human Genome Project decoded the genome. So basically what that means is that they read every single base, A, T, Cs, and Gs, and they put them in the right order. And that's called sequencing. Not only did they put them all in the right order, but then they actually interpreted what that said, all the genes that I told you about, and then all the elements like the on off switches. And this is critical for human health. So um, now Craig Venter, who was also um, cracking the code, started a company in uh, San Diego called Human Longevity with the idea that if you understand all the code that goes into your genome, that you might be able to improve your health over time. So sequencing and assembling a genome is sort of like putting together a, a puzzle of a cloud. Um, you know, we can basically sequence or find ATs and, G, ATCs and Gs in a specific stretch, but we have a limitation of doing the whole thing like that, um, all 3 billion bases at the same time. So we use technologies that do it in little snippets. So it's like a puzzle that we have to put to get back together. And that's one of the things that my lab at the SOC focuses on. However, the human genome is sort of like clouds, but clouds that you can sort of tell the difference from. Whereas it turns out that the cannabis genome is like clouds and sky. Um, so really hard to put that puzzle together. And it wasn't really known why that was really hard to put together until recently when we actually sequenced it. And it turns out that it has some very young jumping genes which I'm gonna tell you more about. The other thing that made it possible for us to sequence the cannabis genome now is that this new technology came out. And yes, this is a computer and this is the sequencer. So this is sort of like Star Trek in my mind. This little thing can sequence a whole human genome. So 3 billion bases, no problem. Um, and the other thing is it doesn't just sequence it in little chunks now, it sequences it in really big chunks or 100,000 kilobases, 100,000 ATCs and Gs all at the same time. So this has really made it possible to sequence. And um, this is actually an innovation that came out of Santa Cruz. So um, lots of good things come out of Santa Cruz, but a professor up there had this idea. Well, I can take these proteins that I told you about, these machines, these molecular machines. And if I actually could string a piece of DNA through it, then I could read that DNA. It was like an aha moment. It took about 20 years to then perfect this technology. Most people refer to this as the holy grail of sequencing. Um, it's better known as nanopore sequencing. Um, and this has enabled us to really change the way that we look at um, all organisms and coming to you know, your phone soon, would be this attachment where you can actually sequence your own genome, or you know maybe you want to check your COVID status. Um, and this is truly going to revolutionize the way that we do medicine. But currently, it's revolutionizing the way we understand the journey of cannabis. So what we did is, um, like I said, we wanted to understand what was going on in these high CBD lines. Like, why is it making CBD and not THC? Um, so we got this line, CBDRX, which has that name because it's used for um, a medication. Um, and it's a high CBD line that is related to lots of the other high CBD lines that are out there. It's 15% CBD and then very low THC. And that means that it can actually be grown um, as hemp. Um, so technically this is not marijuana by the, the legal definition. 
Um, we sequenced it with this technology, Oxford Nanopore, and this was the first high quality genome. So this is 20 years after they sequenced the human genome. And several people have tried to sequence the cannabis genome, but they were unable to really put it all together. You know, they basically had half a puzzle together with all the pieces strewn about. Um, and ironically enough, our, menu, our paper that describes this work just came out in New Phytologist um, where we describe this genome. And um, if you're interested in more of a technical aspect of this work, um, this, this is a very nice paper, I think. So just like humans that have 23 chromosomes and, and an X and a Y, cannabis also has um, an X and a Y chromosome. So it's dioecious, male and female, and it has 10 chromosomes. We can take these 10 chromosomes and we can put them onto a, what we call a genetic map. Um, and all a genetic map is taking the actual chromosomes and then finding landmarks in that map of things that we know. Um, and what we do know is that there was a place on chromosome nine where we thought these genes that I told you about, the synthase genes were located. And this, we knew this from genetic work that had been done many years ago. Um, but this, we hadn't been able to sequence it or resolve it. Well, this was the first time that we were able to put this together. And what we found is that there were three different islands on this chromosome that had um, 13 different synthase genes. So these are the genes that we think are responsible for that last step. But one thing that was really interesting is that it actually had genes for THC acid synthase in addition to the CBD acid synthase. So all the genes were there to make THC and CBD. The other thing that was really interesting is that they were nestled into these jumping gene islands or transposon islands. Um, and this is relevant because that's why we couldn't actually sequence them before because these jumping genes are like the clouds that you can't assemble. They look exactly the same. So they're really hard to put the puzzle pieces back together. So what did this look like? So this is a more technical slide when we, as people that study genomes, look at um, the information in a genome, we use these genome browsers. And really what there are is just taking the genome in a linear way and then looking at features on the genome. So, and then we build tracks that tell you where the different things are. So I've lined them up to the segment in the genome. The red here is um, demonstrated here where we have THC acid synthase. And we have in red at the top, all the different genes that we identified, all the THC acid synthase, synthases, and then all of the little fragments of jumping genes. So all these little fragments of jumping genes are strewn about um, around these genes, about the THC acid synthase, making it very difficult to assemble. And then the same thing was true, but with different jumping genes. Um, and they're color coded to show that we even still get some of these purple ones down here. But basically you have the CBD acid synthases in red here, and then the jumping genes that all surround them. So really what I want you to take home from this is that we have the genes and then they're basically surrounded by uh, these jumping genes. And why is that significant? What, what, what's going on here? Well, let me tell you a little bit about jumping genes. So Barbara McClintock made a very astute observation that maize or corn has all these different colored kernels and sometimes they look really beautiful and things like that. And she reasoned and then did some experiments to show it was actually due to these jumping genes that we're calling transposons. And I'm gonna tell you a little bit more about those, but she won the Nobel prize in 1983 for this. Um, and she's one of the only three um, Nobel prizes for plants at the moment. But this observation in plants was critical because the human genome is made up of um, all these jumping genes as well. So this is a common feature of all plants and animals. So what are jumping genes? Well, it turns out that jumping genes are ancient viruses that have jumped into the genome of the organism, in this case, cannabis. And they basically insert their DNA or their genome 
into the genome of the plant or animal. And why is that important? Well, these jumping genes, once they're in your genome, they jump around and go to different places. And they're known to actually grab pieces of DNA when they jump from one place to another, they might hold on to pieces from the other part of the genome and move it around. Now, this is how genomes evolve, how genomes change the moving of this DNA. So a lot of people will call this junk DNA, but it's actually now known that a lot of this DNA is actually calling, causing innovation in the genome. And in terms of the cannabis genome, it made a very fundamental innovation. So two different ancient viruses invaded the genome and they landed next to this copy of CBD acid synthase. And then basically farmers would be growing cannabis and then selecting the best lines. Well, because they were selecting the best lines that was causing this island, or as I'm calling them cassettes, of jumping elements to stick together and then jump around the genome. And so it was the actions of the farmers that was actually, that were selecting on the plant, having these jumping genes holding the CBD acid th synthase and then perpetuating that in the cannabis line. But the story is actually a little bit more complicated. So bacteria, also insert their DNA into plants and animals. And um, this is actually the way that scientists like myself would hijack the genome of a plant and put what we call genetically modified information into that plant. Now, this is a natural process. Um, this happens all the time. You might have seen a tree like this. This is crown gall. Um, and this is just a natural bacterium, agrobacterium, that infects the plant and makes this crown gall. It insects, inserts its DNA into the genome of the plant, and then it makes the plant make this chemical that causes the crown gall. Some people call it like a cancer. Um, it's very different from a cancer, actually, um, but it has some of the same um, phenotypes or outward um, uh, implications of a cancer, like it's a big growth on a tree. Um, bacteria do this naturally though. This is just one example. Bacteria naturally insert their DNA into plants and animals. And so we find that some plants have genes from bacteria. Now we use this in the lab um, through a very controlled process. And this is um, how GMOs are actually made genetically modified organisms. So we put the fragment of DNA, almost always either a bacterial gene or a plant gene, and we put it in this Thai plasmid, or it's a circular piece of DNA in the bacteria. And then the bacteria is basically, you know, it has the capability of taking that DNA and inserting it into a plant cell. And so in the lab, we can take this to the process, and then we can make what are called GMO or transgenic plants. So it's a, um, scientists have just usurped this natural process to use it in the lab. So let's go back to this synthase gene. So this synthase gene, CBD acid synthase, actually has no introns. So I showed you back when we parse DNA into genes that are made into RNA, that are made into protein, um, some genes have introns and exons. Introns are actually breaks between the exons or the coding regions of the genes, and only eukaryotes have them. It turns out that um, CBDAS does not have any introns. So it is very rare for a plant gene not to have introns. It is always the case, no exceptions, that bacteria do not have introns. So the chances that this is actually a bacterial gene that's been inserted into cannabis is quite high. So this leads us to a potential model where you have a plant, the progenitor to the cannabis plant, the relative, and 
a bacterium injects this gene into the background. Some animal probably is, you know, picking off either the flowers or it's picking the leaves and it's eating and it's like, wow, this is great. Well, it's gonna eat those more often. If it's eating the flowers, it's gonna get the seeds and then it's going to spread those seeds. And that plant that has that new innovation, the new CBD acid synthase is going to be perpetuated. So just evolution working at its best. The animal does the selection, then the virus moves it around the genome, jumps it around, does the innovation that's selected on by farmers. And lo and behold, you have the first part of the cannabis journey. But there's a more recent journey. So the, my journey with cannabis actually started when I was a teenager becoming fascinated, not necessarily with the THC, but with the, the plant itself. So um, like I said, it, it's actually really important in terms of hemp and the kind of breeding that's gone into hemp, but also just the story of how, when it was illegal, how people did the crossbreeding and all of the different um, breeding that was necessary to make it the plant that it is today. Now, if, if you go into a dispensary right now, what you'll notice is that a lot of the plants are over 20% THC. What that means is that the breeding has made it so that the plant is making 20% of what it does into THC just for us or for this animal. And that's pretty phenomenal. So the whole process of how it does this is an, a fascinating story. So let's take a look at some history. Well, this might look familiar to if you've ever done 23andMe. You know, what, what I wanna say about this is that you, we have the ability now with a sequence genome and then being able to get our own genome sequence to start putting ourselves into the context of the history of um, the human race. And this and that allows us to see who we're related to just based on our DNA. And so this is a 23 and me report of ancestry. Um, there was this really nice paper last year that basically did something very similar, but did it for a much larger population. And you can start seeing how people are actually related. You know, some of these things are just obvious, like Europeans are related to other Europeans. But then you can start to see how the distance between say Africans and then East Asians. Um, so this basically is what we call a principal component plot. And it takes a 3D piece of information or a multi-dimensional piece of information and turns it into two dimensions so you can see how things are related to one another. So let's do the same thing with, um, with cannabis. So cannabis, like I said, is a storied breeding experiment over the last 100 years. Before that, it was also a highly bred plant, but just the pressure to breed lines that make so much THC has been phenomenal over the last 100 years. And people generally keep track of their lines. So they have very good pedigrees. Um, so we can access these pedigrees from all over the world and we can then ask specific questions about um, how they're related and how they're not related. Now, this actually really struck me um, and it really fascinates me that um, we got this result. So I'm gonna show you another PCA plot. So this, remember this is a, we're taking multidimensional genomic data and we're turning it into two dimensions. The dimensions that I'm showing you here are domestication on the y-axis going from less domesticated to more domesticated, and then marijuana to hemp on the x-axis going, going from marijuana here to hemp. And what you'll see is that we can clearly separate, separate those um, three categories. So naturalized, marijuana, and hemp. And naturalized in this case is like wild um, cannabis. What's really fascinating is just the amount of breeding that has separated them in terms of the genome. So they are very distinct plants because of the breeding away from the wild varieties. Now, in our study, we had a couple um, lines to represent them. So skunk number one 
is a um, marijuana plant that has really high THC levels. Carmen is a hemp plant that has below 0.3% um, THC. Now, the line that we sequence, I've already told you, high CBD, but it has the THC acid synthase locus. It also has the CBD acid synthase locus. However, it makes less than 0.3% THC and makes high CBD. Yet, from a population genetics level, it is related to a marijuana plant. So how can this be? So another way to look at this is through these um, ancestry proportion plots. Um, and if you dabble in ancestry at all um, or look into human ancestry, these plots are becoming very popular. Um, basically on the y-axis you have ancestry and this blue basically is all of the, um, um, not the wild, versions of the genome. And then in red, you basically have um, the marijuana versions of the genome. And then over here, you have the hemp versions of the genome. And you can see that the hemp parts are pretty dominant over here. And the marijuana is generally a mix of wild and hemp. However, our CBDRX is right here. And what you can see is that it has mixed lineage. So it's basically, um, mostly um, marijuana and very little hemp. So how is this possible? Well, it turns out that the breeding process plays a role in this. So, so much breeding went into the plants to make them high THC, that those lines really had one thing they're trying to do, and that was making high THC. When the breeders came along and said, well, we want them to make high CBD and we want them to have a lot of the characteristics, the elite characteristics of those marijuana plants. They said, okay, well, we'll do something by breeding these two together. And when they brought them together, then they would select on the features of the marijuana plant while it still have high CBD. And this is called introgression. So, taking a portion of one genome that has a trait of interest and putting it into another background of interest. So the marijuana background with the CBD locus. And it's interesting because the THC locus is still there, but so they must have bred something very specific that turns it off. So to put this all together, so your first event is that the bacterium many, many years ago, injected DNA into cannabis. It could, have been a, it could have been actually a relative of cannabis, something that came before cannabis. By injecting in this gene, the synthase gene, animals selected for this plant. More seeds got spread. More seeds that actually had the synthase gene were left over. And then, maybe at the same time or sometime even earlier, and it could have been at the same time, who knows exactly when it happened, but these ancient viruses inserted their DNA. This all came together into a cassette and now it moves around the genome. And this has been selected on for over 10,000 years by farmers. So we know at least it's been bred by humans for 10,000 years. More recently, as modern cannabis breeders have desired new traits, they've been taking these lines, these elite marijuana lines, and then crossing back in or introgressing these CBDS lo loci genes so that they can get high CBD in these backgrounds. So the journey of cannabis started with what I would call a natural GMO event, genetically modified organism. It was modified not only by viruses, but by bacteria. And then that was selected on by humans. And more recently um, by cannabis breeders trying to find the best lines. So in conclusion, 
Um, I, I, I have to say, I was super excited when we were able to finally assemble the cannabis genome and to be able to see the synthase loci um, and the genes and the organization. Um, it's, it's something that as a scientist, you spend your whole life trying um, to figure things out and you sometimes get to uh, set up an experiment and actually test something and figure it out. And, and that's, a, that's a, an incredible moment. And it was really because of this new sequencing technology, the holy grail of sequencing, which is basically a USB sized sequencer that allows you to read the DNA directly through a protein pore. So this molecular motor. The key enzyme or protein controlling um, production of THC and CBD, which is the synthase, seems to have a bacterial origin and has been moved around in these cassettes by an ancient virus. And actually the significance of that is that if, you, if it weren't are surrounded by these ancient viruses, these transposons, these jumping genes, it wouldn't move. And it wouldn't actually be chosen any differently because, but because it could move, it gives different plants different characteristics. And because they have different characteristics, Farmers, breeders, see those characteristics and choose those plants. Finally, the current high CBD lines are really marijuana lines, just with the CBD in. So I think the definition um, is really a legal definition, like I said at the beginning. It's not really a technical definition of hemp versus marijuana. Um, and really with the legalization of marijuana in California and in, now in other states as well, um, the opportunity for research in cannabis has completely opened up in such a new way that um, I think this plant is gonna um, tell us a lot more, not just about the history of where, how it came to be such an iconic plant, but also how it does things in a tremendous way, like how, how does hemp grow so fast? What are, what are some of the secrets associated with that? Why does it make so much biomass? Um, and I think that there's gonna be an, an incredible opportunity to understand these natural um, therapies such as CBD, which have a huge impact on people. And I have heard many testimonials of where people have stopped using um, narcotics um, for pain um, and started using CBD instead, which is something that we already make. Endocannabinoids are something we already make. So there's a real um, beautiful opportunity here. I do wanna say that not, nothing is possible without all the people that I collaborate and without uh, my own lab. And so it's always important to point out, um, you know, the people that make these things work and a specific, specific shout out to um, my collaborator, Chris Grassa at Harvard University. Um, he's the lead author in this paper and had a lot of, um, done a lot of great work to make sure that it was successful.